this extremely challenging area from a range of different perspectives and and obviously um it hasn't gone unmissed that this is uh, ongoing while the budget is uh, happening as well with rishi sunak talking about uh, the future of the uk's finances as well and um, we've got four great speakers and I, i'm not going to kind of overindulge uh, on their bios they are available and i'd encourage you to kind of uh, have a look at those as well uh, but we've got Arsa uh, lindholm dahlstrand from circle at uh, lund university we've got uh, peter who's joining us peter jeffs from um, brunel university where he's a professor of accounting with a focus on professional practice uh, ian evans who's got up early today he's the chief investment officer at physical sciences innovation in vancouver um, and the discussant will be um, rebecca todd who's the investment director at longwall ventures so um we're going to ask each of the speakers uh, to please keep to the allocated time of 10 minutes. Um, we're then going to hear from Rebecca after that. And if people do have questions, please raise uh, them in the chat as we go. I'll try and bring those uh, into the discussion uh, and we should finish promptly uh, at two o'clock. So um, I'm happy to hand over to our first speaker. So I'll start over to you. Thank you very much. Uh... I will have to try to do this very quick because I originally planned for 20 minutes. So let's see if I can share my screen. Where did that one go? Uh oh. Now it's gone. Where is it? happen again. We tested it just before and then it worked. <laughs> okay. Paula, have you got those slides to share? Yep, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to do it and we tested it before and then it worked. Oh, can you Back. see it now? Yeah, we, we can see it now. Oh, that was good. <laughs> okay, so my name is Osa Lindholm Dahlstrand. I'm Professor in Innovation Studies at Lund University in Sweden. I'm also a visiting professor at Birkbeck, so it's very good to be here, even though I couldn't come physically. Uh, Helen Lotton smith asked me if I could present a few findings uh, from a relatively recent study that we did of uh, innovative Swedish SMEs. And all of those companies were funded by our government agency, Vinova, the Agency for Innovation. So it's all about the perspectives uh, from public financing of innovation projects in SMEs. And public funding has quite a different uh, rationale than public funding. So what we did, uh, we looked at the direct effects of public funding, the direct effects of funding either innovation projects or innovative SMEs. There has been a lot of criticism uh, in Sweden, for example, but in many other countries where uh, evaluations often claim that there are very limited effects of public funding. So that might be true that the direct effects of public funding doesn't really demonstrate as a high growth companies in general. But what we wanted to test is the other kinds of effects, the spillover effect, the indirect effects, and also effects on, on the system transition itself. So we did uh, a number of personal interviews and telephone interviews and physical meetings in 60 SMEs and then a number um, of follow up, follow up. Oh, I got an echo now. Follow up uh, interviews with collaborating partners, etc. So just short about the sample, it's relatively young firms. Uh, they quite often are unprofitable. Uh, they are funded more than once by uh, the government agency. And they are quite often very technology based, they have a lot of patents, etc. But very often these companies are um, university based or, or university origin companies. Oops. 
So we started by looking at the direct effects. In this case, it's just an illustration about the growth in uh, turnover, for example. And we can see that the direct effects is very, very skewed. The growth in these companies are very skewed. There are a few percent of the firms around 15 with a very high growth. They are 20, which are quite uh, stagnated. They, they have a, actually a negative growth. And the big bulk is the, like some people call the living dead, 65% where not much happens. But the innovation journeys, as we see them, are not linear and they build on each other. And as I said, quite often these companies uh, get funding several times in several follow on projects. Uh, what we identified here is three uh, interesting groups of companies as we see them and it's a little bit similar to the figure of the growth and share of SMEs. But we find that the high growth companies, high growth innovative SMEs in Sweden uh, tend to get acquired to a very high extent. Actually 15% of the firms were acquired. Uh, we find that the ones with the negative growth they are typically SMEs that wouldn't have survived without the public funding. And then we find this very interesting group of university linked firms, quite often stagnated with very limited growth, but very important other kinds of effects. So just very, very quick, we looked at, as I said, spillover effects the influence these SMEs have on their partners and partners can be customers and universities quite often and all other kinds of collaborators. And what they do spill over is often um, intellectual property, of course, but they also have an effect on the growth of the companies with whom they collaborate. So that is quite important. And moreover, we also looked at um, ownership changes and in fact those 60 SMEs they have spun off additional firms which they partly own still so actually those 60 firms are now 100 firms actually and if we would like to look at the effects of the investments maybe we should also include these And as I said, we also tried a very rough way of looking at the effects on the system functions. And we simply asked the companies on their view and to give illustrations on how they have affected the system itself. And we used the so-called T's perspective. So we looked at the knowledge development, the direction of knowledge development, regional labor market and resources, the entrepreneurial experimentation, and uh, creation of new markets and business models, but also their influence on the institutional setting and legitimacy. I can't pronounce that today. So what we found is that most of these firms actually influenced several of the functions, and in a few cases, actually all those functions. So it was quite usual that they have, uh, had an influence on at least two or three functions. But as I said, we uh, found three interesting groups. So I'm going to say a few words about them. We found 22% of the SMEs that claim they wouldn't have survived without this public support. Those firms are generally not university linked firms. So that's a very typical characteristic. They are smaller firms. They tend to get fewer projects funded and we can see very, very limited effect. We can't really see any effects on the direct effect on growth, things like that. We see hardly any spillover effects and no uh, really effects on the systems itself. Also, those firms tend to not be acquired by others. And then we have the university linked and the acquired firms that perhaps are more interesting. And we say that as much as 60% of the SMEs originate from university research and they get more public funding, both higher amounts and more projects. And they also have higher spillover effects on others 
and they affect a lot of the functions of the systems. We also find a lot of ownership changes among the university spin-offs. And again, uh, maybe the uh, spin-off from the spin-offs are really, really what's keep the, the system going, so to speak. So those university linked firms are involved in a lot of ownership changes themselves. We find that 13% of the SMEs were acquired later and actually the acquisition was quite often a result of the funding itself. The funding might have helped them to grow and develop, but also uh, to gain legitimacy again, legitimacy <laughs> and uh, attention by the media, etc. But also those companies are in general have very uh, positive results. They are high growth firms and they have very important effects on both spillovers and functions of the system. So when I try to summarize this, I see three interesting groups of innovative SMEs. We have the high growth firms who very often tend to get acquired. And is this really what uh, public funding should aim for? Actually, people at Vinova tend to think that there is where we should invest our money. But I'm not sure. Is this not really OK? It's important that this relatively small group uh, develops. But isn't this really something more for the private venture capital sector? So that's a question for you. We find this group that uh, wouldn't have survived without the public support. And is this really something we should invest in? Of course, they generate a number of jobs, etc. They could be important, but is this where we should put public money? Instead, those living dead that people tend to claim that we shouldn't support here is where we find a lot of university spin-offs and here is where we find a lot of effects, both spillover effects and uh, system effects. Like, for example, we have a very advanced company here in Gothenburg and they have an advanced innovation and they are not employing more than 20 people, but they are spillover effects on other companies in the region and they today employ more than 30,000 people. So maybe here is where we have a role for policy. So just starting to conclude, I guess I spent my time already. We can say that uh, this funding had a lot of uh, contributions uh, for collaboration with others. Uh, we find a lot of spillover effects and that they influence the system in many, many ways. And we shouldn't forget about the spin-offs they create. But remember, it takes a long, long time. So I'm going to stop here. There's a different kind of effects and different time perspectives. And I would be very interesting to hear someone from the private financing sector to comment on this. Thank you. Also, thank you so much for, for racing through that. And there's so much interesting stuff and some of the work that I'm certainly involved with with Innovate UK would benefit from that kind of analysis, I think, on some of their data. Um, especially now the portfolio is being extended from simply grant funding to look at loans and other types of instrument. Um, and, and hopefully some of those those issues we can pick up in the, the discussion as well. So thank you uh, very much for kicking us off today. I think uh, I'm going to hand over to Peter next, who's going to draw on his uh, experience both at DIT and uh, in, in the private world. Uh, so Peter, I'll, I'll hand over to you if I may. Thank you very much, Tim, and uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here. Uh, I'm an alumnus of um, Birkbeck. I did my PhD here under the very capable supervision of Professor Lawton Smith. Um, but I'd, I'd like to talk to you today um, with my, as Tim said, with one of my other hats on as um, someone who's worked um, alongside and, and in the department for international trade for a number of years um, just because it might be interesting to some of you to know what um, a UK government department has has interest in in these particular topics and when I saw the um, the overview of the uh, of, of what the speakers were going to be talking about so public or private um, 
uh, equity finance in particular, selective, non-selective financing, um, that chimes really well with, with some of the things that we look at on a day-to-day -day basis at the DIT. So just a little background maybe firstly on, on the Department for International Trade, which I will refer to as, as the, the DIT throughout. Um, we, as, as a department, we're quite small. We were um, formed in 2016 after after the Brexit vote, um, effectively because the UK would have to set its own trade policy for the first time in um, many decades, and and we needed to have um, one ministry that looked after that. So, as as far as we make the outside media, you'll probably see. Um, DIT people um, or, or ministers appearing on your TV screens with a big smile on their face and brandishing a, uh, a document showing that we've secured some kind of free trade agreement or um, agreement in principle with uh, an, another nation, trading nations, as we set our um, as, as we set our direction after after leaving the EU. Um, you may have seen in the in the last week we've we've signed a, an agreement in principle with with New Zealand. But that's on the that's on the trade side of, of DIT. So that's thinking about exports, how we increase the, the UK's exports. The other half of DIT, which is the part I work in, is is focused on investment. Um, and when I say investment, I mean foreign direct investment into the UK. So we we want to attract foreign businesses to come to the UK, set up operations here undertake R&D activities, um, develop and grow and create highly skilled jobs and, and be great for, for UK PLC. And, and our Minister for Investment is, is Lord Grimstone. Uh, he's a very strong advocate of, of foreign businesses. Um, he often likes to point out that um, foreign owned UK businesses are more productive um, this has been proved by, by data, I should add, it hasn't, it's not just something he says, um, it, it, they're more productive than homegrown businesses um, and they undertake more R&D um, and, and it will be critical for us to reach that 2.4% that of, of GDP um, for, for our, our UK R&D uh, because we're a bit of a, a laggard at the moment by attracting more more FDI U UK businesses um, UK UK companies founded in the UK may not be able to provide that by themselves. So um, obviously, in some ways, I guess I, I act in my day job as a, a bit of a salesman for for the UK because foreign direct investment is is very mobile. Um, so if you have an international business, they can set up in the UK or they could set up in, in Ireland or, or anywhere really in many cases. Um, so what we have to promote the UK and say what's good about the UK? What, what are the key things we can offer? So part of the team I work in um, are focused on, on, I guess, promoting the, the key aspects of the UK business environment that will that we we say this is this is good in the UK we're better than than X or Y so come to us and set up so the things we we promote are the the tax environment which is the, my area of, of expertise that's what I I tell uh, foreign companies how great the UK tax system is um, our, our skills our universities we you know UK universities are um, have international reputations and, and often that's the number one thing that, that brings people to the UK, the quality of the research done in, in UK universities. Um, the wider R&D, so done, done by both private and public sector, um, but also our, our finance. So obviously uh, London and is a, is a financial centre of, of um, worldwide repute, I would say. And, and businesses, obviously, when they come to us, are interested in what are their financing options if they wanted to come and set up in the UK. So we we don't, as, as government, um, you know, we, we only want to provide a, a broad overview to these companies. So that the first thing we really want to do is to ship these inquiries out to the, the true experts in the field um, and, and, and they can get down to, to brass tacks and, and details and, and numbers and spreadsheets and all that kind of thing. But we, we have to have an overview and, and a general understanding as to the, the UK environment for finance. So we, we talk to um, overseas businesses about things like um, uh, listing, um, equity financing, so 
VCs, obviously private equity industries, um, business angels, individuals. Um, I guess these are probably more along the, the selective lines, so um, these won't be applicable for, for every business. And obviously the, the, the decision to make that financing will be a hard commercial decision. We can't influence that as government at all. Um, we talk to them about debt that they can can raise either on the markets uh, or, or through, through other means. Um, we discuss grants with them, so uh, it, bodies like Innovate UK, um, and and obviously you know these are often very competitive kind of grants, and again a, a selective form of of financing potentially. Um, we talk to them about incentives, so. Um, for instance, uh, we, we've recently in the UK set up a, um, uh, areas called free ports. So these are uh, zones based around airports or, or seaports where um, there are tax incentives for, for setting up. Um, again, these, these can be very valuable for, for businesses who are thinking maybe of looking at those locations. And again, this is a really important um, part, I would say, of the, the levelling up strategy that's um, big uh, big news in government at the moment that everyone wants to be a part of. So these free ports tend to be situated in, in areas that, that need levelling up, to, to, to put it in that way. Um, and then we discuss tax reliefs. Um, so these these are definitely non-selective, um, you know, things like R&D tax credits. So the, the UK, um, UK will pay businesses um, either by reducing their tax bills or even presenting them with, with cash rebates for R&D they undertake. Um, and these are very, very important source of financing for for R&D intensive businesses, certainly. Um, and that, again, they're not selective in any way. If you're doing the R&D, you get the tax credit paid back by, by HMRC, assuming you are doing the, the R&D, of course. Um, we have other, other incentives like the, the patent box, which um, offers low rates of tax on um, profits derived from, from IP, from patents specifically. And then we have another, a number of other schemes um, designed like the, the, the enterprise investment scheme, which is all about um, providing tax reliefs to individual investors who invest in equity um, of startup and, and, and risky companies. So I think that just maybe gives you uh, an overview of the kind of things that we're, we're saying to businesses as, as DIT. Um, we work alongside closely with the, the, the British Business Bank. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that's a, a government owned business development bank. So they've had to be, um, become quite innovative in, in their financing solutions um, with, the, with the pandemic. Um, so then they, they offer a whole range of um, financing options for businesses. So things like startup loans for, um, for smaller amounts. Um, we, we also had during the pandemic the Futures Fund, um, which was um, really quite extraordinary, really, to see a, a conservative government um, taking equity, a conservative party government taking equity stakes in in um, in high tech businesses. So um, so hopefully that will bear fruit in, in in future years as those companies develop and those stakes can be be sold, hopefully um, benefiting UK um, UK public as rather than all going to the, the financiers um, and a range of COVID loans uh, again to, to help businesses through the, the difficult period. Um, and, and one other um, area of current interest is, is the patient capital um, funding available. So trying to encourage, I, I guess, um, a, a long term perspective on, on, on funding um, tech and risky, risky businesses. Um, so I think I, I'll draw it to a close there. Um, I just hope, hope that's been useful, as I say, just giving you maybe a, a, an, an insight into um, government's in, in involvement in this, this area. And um, I'll, I'll be very happy to um, field any, any questions at the, the end. Um, so thank you very much. Back to you, Tim. Thank you, Peter. And, and I think it kind of really resonates for me that not just thinking about investment um, in a vacuum, it is part of that ecosystem, like you say, and that ecosystem is increasingly global. We need to kind of understand and recognise the, the assets as part of that ecosystem. And, and you mentioned there, obviously, the research base. Um, and again, in terms of some of the things that also said there around the kind of the university type spin out activity, uh, all enriching that kind of that knowledge base, which attracts businesses in as well as creating a, a, an attractive business environment in which to operate. 
Um, our next speaker, Ian Evans, uh, is coming at this as a, an investment officer, and I think they're kind of bringing a, another and different perspective to the table. So, Ian, I'll, I'll hand over to you, if I may. Thanks, Tim, and, and thanks also for the presentation and, and Peter for your comments. Um, I, fi I find it really interesting, actually, having studied in the UK and now kind of uh, applying some of that knowledge in, in, in Canada, you know, a lot of the same kind of challenges that, that uh, resonate across the pond. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I live in an ecosystem where, you know, I'm, a, I'm the CIO of a, of a venture capital company and I'm, I'm the investment lead for a uh, federally funded public source of funding for project finance for innovation companies. Um, so I, I live definitely on both sides of the divide on how do you apply private capital in the places where you're going to get the greatest return on investment and how can you apply public funding um, similarly to get return on investment, but perhaps um, different kinds of returns. And I think that, that's, an, that's a useful um, uh, differentiation to have when it comes to thinking about where does public funding end and where does private funding take off. And my experience has been one in which it's, it's obviously n not as simple as that. Um, actually, that there's complementarity in the uses of funds, um, particularly where public financing is used on project finance to reduce some of the barriers associated with taking on innovation projects. Um, and that the use of funds around private capital, which tends to have um, less strings attached when it's actually transacted into the companies, um, allows companies to do things to support those innovation activities. I think one of the one of the interesting comments I heard recently from um, quite a well-established deep tech founder was that raising capital is actually a failure um, in most in most businesses. Um, what it underlines is the fact that your business model did not work, and that your the rationale for raising capital is to support a new hypothesis um, around what your business should be undertaking, and that the idolization of raising capital, the idolization of raising uh, venture capital, is actually a misconception around um, where benefit is actually created. And I think that that's quite an astute uh, view, uh, given the world of Dragon's Den and Shark Tank and other idolizations of venture capital that exist in, in the ecosystem. Um, so I thought, um, you know, looking at Orsa's presentation, you know, a lot of those um, examples of, um, you know, the living dead, the zombies is what, which I call them uh, in Canada. There's definitely zombie companies who, you know, are on government life support going after one program after the, after the other thinking, you know, this is the easiest money I'll get. Um, and then that is a particular problem. And I think the way that we've um, tended to view that from a private capital point of view on whether we would invest in a company um, that would take that kind of approach is generally a negative one um, because going after project finance after project finance shows an inability to actually grow the company and solve the problem which the company was originally founded to, to solve for. Um, so we've tended to, um, you know, obviously there's a role to play in the establishment of companies getting over the, you know, well-documented valleys of death um, and there's a role for government funding to support some of those activities in, in mitigating risk. But the inability to show progress from project finance, either in terms of the, 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 the dollar value or the, or the euro value or pound value associated with the, the public funding being raised, or the inability to orchestrate public funding and private funding together, um, tends to be a flag for us. Um, so, you know, the companies that stand out, the high growth companies that stand out for us are those organizations that are able to plan capital allocations um, and, and capital raises that mix um, public funding and private sources of funding together to, to you know, mitigate risk, but also accelerate at the same time. And I think that my the third observation that I have is, um, you know, public funding tends to come with uh, very few other sources of capital associated with it. And, and in this, I, I draw upon my own research that I did um, during my PhD, looking at the various forms of social capital, human capital, intellectual capital that VCs provide um, to help expedite the growth of ventures. Um, so it's not just the application of, of financial capital that helps ventures grow. Um, it's the opening up of new networks. It's the connectivity through to customers. It's the connectivity through to universities and intellectual property that uh, may be required to defend the position of, of new ventures. Um, there's layers of additional sources of capital that are important in the growth of businesses. And in many cases, project finance doesn't provide for that. Um, you know, 
my, my role as investment leader, the super cluster is quite an interesting experiment on trying to apply um, a multi-capital view on how we grow companies. So here we very um, uh, intentionally created a collision space. And again, you know, some of the uh, outcomes also from your work around collaboration being a key um, is a key tenant of what we're trying to establish in the super cluster. So we force universities, industry, large corporates um, to partner in a multi-party agreement where every all of those organizations are signing up to the same thing, um, but having de different delivery mechanisms and different delivery um, uh, requirements um, in and around a, a particular project. So what we do here is force different forms of capital to come together and to collaborate, not just sign um, capital over to one organization and hope that they get on with it and do do all those pieces of work. Actually, we we force it into the project finance uh, framework. And very often this is running off the back of uh, an innovative SME who's raised capital, you know, in most cases from venture capital sources. Um, so we have a, an, an ability to orchestrate various types of capital and various types of organizations, hopefully to generate greater returns for, for, from public finance. So, you know, I, I think there's some really interesting and um, uh, findings also that, that that you have there that are definitely in line with what I'm seeing in, in Canada in terms of, um, you know, the balance of dead weight, the living dead and the high growth. Um, and I think going forward, you know, the ability to orchestrate public and private financing, that 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 orchestration role is is very difficult to find actually in, in individual organizations. It's not something that we teach in Entrepreneurship 101. It's not something we teach in any of the accelerator and incubator programs. Um, and, you know, Steve Blank has a lot to answer for in his Lean Launchpad process on, the, on this particular point. Um, but, you know, going forward, I think that that ability to orchestrate, plan um, and build momentum around the thesis of what, uh, what the venture is trying to do and what the roles of um, partner organizations in that future looks like is, is an important thing for, for policy to consider. Um, so I'll leave my comments there and, and happy to answer questions. No, that, that's great. And, and, and I think kind of you drew together the, the kind of the conversation to this point really nicely. I think the, uh, the interesting thing about thinking of investment of this nature is the portfolio approach, not to think of public and private as kind of opposites, but how do they complement? Where can they come together? And, and the ways in which there are different fiscal instruments to kind of make that happen. Um, now, it's easy to make a couple of observations like that. I'm, I'm quite pleased that I'm not the discussant at this point because there's been so much that has been presented. So uh, I'm delighted to hand over to Rebecca, who is the Investment Director at Longwall Ventures. So Rebecca, I'll hand over to you for some observations. Hi, thank you. Um, gosh, that was so much food for thought and really, really interesting. And most of it absolutely music to my ears because uh, it's, it's just, it just reflects a lot of the experiences that, that I've seen over the years. I've been investing in um, uh, a, a really early stage science and technology based. People nowadays call it tough tech, which I think is, is quite appropriate. Um, companies since uh, for about 15 years now um, and following the journeys of various and seeing see these, these things come. So this topic was really interesting to me for, 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 because it, it, it's, it's at the sort of nub of the issue of being an early stage investor in these companies. Um, Longwall long invests in all sorts of different types of technology. I specialise generally in medical and healthcare, but the, the same patterns you can see across the different sectors. Um, and um, I would say that most of our companies have been in the UK have benefited from Innovate UK grants. Um, and the Innovate UK grants have been material to getting to them to, to where they are. Um, and um, so you know, our role as, as early stage investors is, you know, the reality of my life is a constant flow of investment approaches. Um, you know, we kind of rather crudely call it deal flow. Um, the numbers are quite often staggering to startup companies when they realise um, how many different approaches we get. You know, the majority of approaches we get are, um, an, uh, are not appropriate for our fund. And it, you know, it's, it's a really steep learning curve for the people running those companies to figure out how to to better target and how to see where they might fit. Um, and that's one of the you know, it's just it's just one of the, um, the, the the industry dynamics that we're kind of all operating in. <clears throat> but from as an early stage investor, then you know, my job is to is essentially to get convinced 
fiction, and that word conviction is, is important actually, around a few companies and teams, technologies and opportunities, um, and then then um, agree agree to sort of become the financial, we like to think of ourselves really as sort of financial partners, because we invest early and then we continue to back those companies. And um, we hope, we, we do hope we bring some of what Ian um, uh, talked about in terms of sort of added um, capital that's not just financial capital around the business, although I, I'm sceptical about what you know, we vary quite a lot, I think, in terms of how much added value different investors bring. Um, but the, with the, the grant funding you know, for, for technology companies provides an enormously important bridge to getting that conviction. You know, I, you know, we have very occasionally backed people kind of with an idea and a patent and, you know, and one person in a very small way, but it's extremely difficult for most people managing. You know, remember, I'm managing other people's money. It's a mixture of government money and pension funds for people like, you know, you and I um, and, and private investors. But to kind of, you know, you, you need to have a reason to believe, you need to have a reason to make a case that there's a good investment to be made here. And the, the role of the grant funding in these companies is, is validating some concept, is giving, giving us reason to believe, um, is giving us a basis for forming conviction um, on, on that opportunity. Um, and so it, it's, so, but, but I found ACES data super interesting and the points that she raised really interesting because one of my frustrations in this sector is when people talk about all the companies that can't get money and that they're being funding gaps, they're being valleys of death, all that sort of thing. The answer constantly seems to be, um, believed to be, we just need more venture capital. And that, you know, I fundamentally think that that is just missing the point completely and ACES um, comments sort of, I sympathise with enormously because venture capital is appropriate for a really, really small number of SMEs. In the whole world of SMEs, a lot of which are sort of individual service companies to start with, um, all sorts of different import export companies, goodness knows what, you know, um, <laughs> I think uh, Peter at TIT could probably give you a better profile of, of the world of SMEs than I can. I'm looking at a tiny fraction of, high, of companies developing really interesting high tech innovations going to a very particular market. Um, and even within that, a very small proportion can ever um, deliver the high growth that a venture capital investor needs to invest in. And simply saying we need more venture capital misses the point of how do you finance those companies that will never be appropriate for VC. So when um, when Ian, you were saying, you know, you should, raising venture capital should be kind of seen as a failure, it kind of, it absolutely chimes with me because that's but I go to accelerator programs and say, please don't raise equity financing unless you absolutely, it's absolutely, you need it. It is the best route to finance your business and you've investigated all other options. Now, if you have a tech that can, you know, if you can cure cancer with a new drug and it's going to be really valuable and is going to be, offer a big return to financial investors if it works, and it, but there's a high risk to get there, that's appropriate for venture capital. But in the world of SMEs, that's just a tiny fraction of companies. And I thought, so I thought I was really interested to hear Easter saying there's, there's got to be other solutions for the rest of them. And a lot of them are those zombie companies as we see it. I've heard, I've heard grant funders in this country re, re, um, describing them as frequent flyers, um, where you know they go from grant to grant to grant. And what it is is a failure of finding a business model that provides um, a financial return to backers. Um, and there's, there's different ways that they can't find that, that offer that return, in, in, in my view. I turn down things because they're not going to provide you know, venture capital. The business model of venture capital is all about the exit. You know, we invest early, we have a stake, we have that company grow, and then we need to sell that company or list it and get a high value exit. You know, there's a lot of companies, um, especially in Europe, uh, where the markets are smaller sometimes. There are just a lot of companies where they will get an exit, but it's going to be here, not here. And that's perfectly reasonable and that's the right expectation. But if it's here and the funds that can back it need here, then they fall between the gaps. Um, and you know, so the, there's the question as to the role of public finance to plug some of those gaps 
is absolutely spot on as, as far as as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so, so you know, the the accelerator programs have have absolutely changed the world for me. In that the companies I met 15 years ago, that sort of the learnings that people have had from lean startup, which you mentioned, <laughs> which you mentioned, Ian. I mean, I've coached on the lean startup accelerator, and and you know, it's absolutely changed the world because people now actually go out and figure out who the customer is when, you know, they weren't 15 years ago <laughs> necessarily, and they understand why their their technology might have an application. But it is absolutely the missing gap is the financing strategy, and I I do separate workshops with accelerators to in a deliberate attempt to kind of say you can't have a bit of commercial strategy without a financing strategy. You know what's what kind of business models that create, what kind of markets that create, and where does it go? And the two go absolutely hand in hand, and you have to match the right cap the way to finance your business with that with whatever the plan is to develop that technology and commercialize it. Um, so, so you know that that was my my kind of desire to join this today was to kind of get across the message of venture capital isn't the answer. Um, you know, I think you know it's it's a really key important part of the ecosystem. Of course, it is, but with the, there are gaps, and those gaps um, can't just be plugged with more venture capital. So I'll I'll leave it there. Then we've got lots of time for some questions. Lovely. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So if anyone does have any questions, either please signal or, or do kind of put your um, your question into the chat and I'll quite happily try and incorporate that in. I suppose just while waiting to see if anyone does want to come forward with any questions for any of the speakers or or points that they'd like to see people respond to. Okay. So you put your, your, your hand up there. I, 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 just to kind of kick it off as well, one of the things that kind of interests me is the complementarity and how we understand that and see that. And I suppose I'd be interested in hearing from the panel as we go around about any thoughts on that and challenges from your perspective to make that better. How can it be improved? And certainly I, I, the work we've been doing with Innovate UK, analyzing um, some of the British Business Bank data is that debt finance quite rightly is still the most sought after type of finance, uh, certainly among UK firms and UK innovative firms, which I think is, is hugely important to emphasise. But uh, also, I'll come to you. OK, thank you. It's, it was just in case no one else wanted to, to ask questions. I would actually like to ask, is the growth of companies really important from the public perspective? I, we have done so many studies and we seldom can see any effects on economic growth here. So I would like to come back to a discussion we have here in Sweden, and I would like to come back to that example of I had of this little highly innovative firm in Gothenburg. They don't grow and they have a lot of public funding. They don't grow, but their neighbor, they have the same board, etc. It's one of the highest growth SME. It's no longer an SME. It's a real success in Sweden in the last, last decade. But that company was sold recently to the US and it doesn't exist any longer, but it's a high success. But then is this really, this is what we debate in my country, is this really what we want? And a few years ago, I was uh, part of the Economic Council of Invest Sweden, Invest Sweden Agency. But that one was closed down more or less, or they actually merged it with Business Sweden, which works much more with export, etc., and said that, do we really want all these uh, FDIs in Sweden? We are very internationalized to start with, but I'm not sure what the answer is. So it, that was just two, two different perspectives of it. But we are quite concerned now with all the more successful SMEs getting sold. So that was where I would like to start a discussion. Thank you. Does anyone want to come in on that, Peter? Do you, given the the uh, international dimension, can I draw you on that? Well, yes, it's a very political question, isn't it? I mean, if you if you asked um, Minister Grimstone, who is the Minister for Investment, he'd say there's no problem with um, you, you selling your um, your 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 homegrown businesses to overseas investors because the, um, they'll be they'll be run better. Um, and become more productive and um, do more R&D, or, or at least that's what happens in the UK. I, I don't know about um, Sweden necessarily. Um, 
But of course, then on the other hand, of course, you, you then have what, what we're seeing in the media at the moment about um, concern over selling, for example, defence companies or, or companies with with um, IP that, um, that, that the government doesn't feel um, should be accessed or, or taken abroad. Um, so I, I I don't think there is an easy answer. I mean that the the evidence seems to be fairly mixed and, and depend on who you're speaking to. But um, um, but from from studies and, and you know and it seems to generate quite passionate views on 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 both sides, which maybe hinders the debate a little and, and means we can't actually dig down into the the numbers and the the true evidence and see what happens. So um, I'm afraid in a classic government way, I probably haven't answered your question really, but at least just raise some of the issues. Um, maybe some of the other panelists can be a bit more. Um, specific. It's all right. Unlike some government ministers, we, we did get a response, so uh, we, we, we'll be grateful for that. But I, I think you kind of raise a, an important issue, and also kind of picking up on what also kind of highlighted here. It's not just about potentially growth as the goal. And if we look at places like Japan, and we look at productivity and and other outcomes that all of these kind of factor into to what we should be striving for. Uh, Emma, can I? I'll, I'll bring you in. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, I'm Emma Palmer Foster. Um, I work as a consultant in the life sciences sector and also I'm a part time PhD student at, at Birkbeck and a friend of Rebecca's, I should add, in case anybody <laughs> notices any sort of favouritism. Um, it's just a, it's just a point on um, companies in the UK being bought. Now, I worked for a long time as a, a stockbroker and, th and there's two things that always occur to me when people sort of talk about companies being bought in, in a vaguely negative way. The first thing is very often, and I'm thinking particularly of a company I work with that got bought last week, very often companies that get bought, um, they are bought by an owner that can invest more in the domestic market, can invest more in their domestic facility and enable that company to spend more on R&D and employ more people. So, so from one point of view, from the, the point of view of the, the government, if you like, M&A is a really good driver of economic growth. And it also shows that we are developing technologies and companies that other companies want to buy, unless you say we're not giving them a big enough valuation. Now, that, then the second thing is, I think, a lack of maybe the general public understanding of how investment works, which is if a company in the UK gets bought, it isn't necessarily a bad thing because it may be have financial returns, substantial returns to our pensions, etc. So I think that's a sort of a, a misunderstanding um, that is is propagated very often. And I just wondered when it, whether any of the panellists have views that differ with mine. And if so, say so. Also, please. Yeah, I have a comment to that. I'm very much in favour of M&As and yes, they are a driver of economic growth, very much so. That was actually my PhD thesis back in the 1990s. So I've been studying this for some time. But we have a concern in Sweden now. We, we are running a project on foreign acquisitions of innovative SMEs and we can see very different patterns. Uh, some foreign uh, countries or companies, they actually invest in lot in Sweden when they acquire this really, let's say deep tech or whatever. But we have a different pattern when it comes to American acquisitions and actually UK acquisitions. Those uh, Americans and UK, they don't behave in the same way. They try to actually take uh, all that asset and move it out of the country. But that can also sometimes have positive effects for example, the money people get, etc. And Swedish people don't always like to move to the US, promise. Uh, and what happens then is that we get new spin-offs. Um, that thing lives on. So it can actually be a number of new firms working. So it's a very interesting dynamics going on. But I'm fascinated by the different... In Sweden, the policymakers were so afraid of the Chinese coming in and buying it. All, all our advanced innovative small firms, but Chinese are not behaving like that. They tend to invest quite heavily in our country, but it's very different from especially the US. Thank you. Ian, can I bring you in? You talked about the kind of collision space and, and again, thinking about some of the outcomes, thinking about what kind of authors just described and also Emma's point. 
your kind of experience in the kind of Canadian context here now, what, how do, what, what are the similarities and some of the differences that are ongoing? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting um, just talking about the M&A strategy and, and Peter's comments around the defence sector in particular, where there's, there's high levels of um, scrutiny about what kind of collaborations occurring with which kind of jurisdictions over which time periods. And, it, you know, we often forget that, you know, political cycles are often shorter than venture capital cycles. And so, um, you know, there's some interesting dynamics around how quickly policy changes um, and how um, structurally um, crystallized some of the capital markets are, in, 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 at least in their model and their timeframes. And so, you know, collaboration is intended to bring those spillover effects right to the front of, of, uh, of business operations. And I think in certain sectors that works really well, um, certainly in digital, um, that works really well. A lot of the work being done in AI and the applications of AI in various ju different jurisdictions, those collaborations are hugely important so that we're not, um, you know, coding for the wrong things um, and actually finding those insights that are important to make the outcomes that, that, that we need. Um, but in other sectors of the economy, you know, those collaborations are very difficult to come by, um, partly because of geopolitical tensions. Uh, partly because of the intellectual property and the, the uh, concerns around leakage of intellectual property uh, to ju different jurisdictions. Um, so collaboration writ large is, is, is certainly not um, an easy thing to, to socially engineer um, from an investment point of view. There are certainly sectors that, that, that work very well in that and, and others that don't. So a one size fits all approach is, is probably doesn't work. Um, and that, you know, a more sector specific approach to collaboration with jurisdictions um, where, um, you know, there's long standing uh, shared interests um, and, and shared outcomes probably makes a lot of sense. And, and I think you, you're starting to see that certainly in Canada's um, innovation policy, um, certainly in its defence procurement policy, uh, which is a big driver of innovation spending in Canada, although it's it's very hard to find it, um, uh, it does occur. Um, so those collaborations where we can find um, meaningfully uh, meaningful alignment in, in mission, um, you know, that's where collaboration can, can really take off. But I, I would state that that's very sector specific and requires a, a, an industrial sectoral approach um, as opposed to a one size fits all. I'm, uh, I'm going to go around all of our contributors in a moment and ask them for a final thought. We've got about five minutes left. So maybe just reflecting on the discussion, if there is something that you would like to leave us with. But Rebecca, before we do that, I'd just like to come to you on the point that Helen has raised in the chat there. And, and you did make a point which I entirely agree with in your remarks about the answer is not a lack of venture capital. And I think that I'd probably even go as far as to say that the, the, or the, that there's not a lack of capital available in the system when we look at it overall. But what, what about patient capital in particular? Helen's raised the point there. Is is that a problem? Is that something that we're not considering in that bigger landscape? Oh, sorry, I can't. I haven't seen the comment. Um, uh, the the, the, the comment it, simply so: is, is, is there is a lack of patient capital not a major problem? So this this is a it's a funny old concept, patient capital, I have to say, because because I think you know the venture capital model has always been relatively long term, um, and um, the the uh, there are people the, the balance sheet model in the UK has been um, where people have been experimenting with patient capital, where they can you know they don't have an, an the point being they don't have an end of fund term. So so the issue one of the challenges with venture capital is that you have a closed end fund structure. You raise the money, that starts the clock, you invest it over a kind of, I don't know, three to five year period, probably, you know, two to three, whatever, whatever kind of works best in your sector with your fund, your investment thesis, then you, you work with those companies and the fund is only 10 years long. So, you know, really you need to be out of those companies in 10 years. So 10 years isn't very long for a university to win now. Now, Longwall's current fund is actually 10 plus five because we do early and we do a lot of of tricky tough tech as I refer to it, which sometimes takes quite a long time. But in reality, even if you've got a balance sheet where you're investing from the companies 
you know, a company's balance sheet. So you, you don't have to kind of deliver exits by a certain time frame. You're just a shareholder, a company being a shareholder in another company. That was a, a, a patient capital model. In reality, you've got to get returns somehow, though, still. And you've still got the pressure of kind of getting a return. Nobody can be so patient that they don't care about making a return on their investment. Um, so, so, you know, it is, a, it is a, a, a sort of slightly, I think, slightly misleading sometimes term. Um, and it's, you need, need to, the, the, you know, if, you're, if you're a patient capital balance sheet investor, you need to balance the stuff that you're going to be super patient with with, with some stuff where you hope you'll get there a bit quicker. Um, because at, at the end of the day, you've, you've got to show some turnover um, and some return on investment um, for your shareholders um, or, to, or ultimately to get to this sort of magic status of evergreen where you're, you're getting returns from companies you invested in 10 years ago and you can reinvest it in the next and you can come to a sort of sustainable status and a sustainable business model. Um, but the, uh, the, I, 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 don't, I don't think, I, I sympathise enormously with the comment that is it a lack of patient capital, um, but I, I, I don't think, I don't think that is the fundamental issue for that reason. I think the fundamental issue is, is not actually, is the companies maybe not being appropriate for that return of capital, that return of investment model at all, or not having found a business model that offers the returns for investors at all, and it, it's 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 financing those that is the, the bigger gap. Uh, it's, it's just my personal experience, um, but because there are there are different every all investors have a slightly different take on on the return the return of of investment and the time frame. Um, and then there's room for different time frames within a portfolio. No, absolutely. And, and again, I think kind of thinking about who is obviously bringing the, the, the nature of where that patient capital might come from and, and VC and the perspective on patients bringing a, a slightly different perspective. Um, we, we are coming up to time. So I, I'm going to invite, if I may, in the order that people presented, just to give us a quick soundbite, really, just something that um, we can leave uh, with those attending just for the afternoon to dwell on. So also, I'll come to you first. OK, I pick up on this uh, patient capital. I think yeah, maybe not patient, but long term is definitely needed somehow in specific let's say sectors, like the sectoral approach suggested, but I think it's especially so when it's research-based ideas, they need a, another kind of treatment. So I take with me uh, today this portfolio approach. I like that a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll come to you next, Peter. Thank you, Tim. Um, yes, I think the, the thing I'd like to just leave people with is um, the difficulty we have in government is getting good information and good contacts with with private sector and universities. Um, often you find policy people in government having to make stuff up because they um, can't have don't have any networks or contacts with real experts in the field. So it's been a tremendously um, valuable, I think, panel today. And um, you know, if if you are interested, please do get in touch. And um, and your your inputs into policy are are absolutely critical um, for, for for DIT and for wider government departments. Thank you. No, thank you, Peter. Um, Ian. So I, I would just raise that in the news today, Sequoia Capital have just broken their fund structure time frame to, to move to a patient capital model. So that's that's an interesting move from one of Silicon Valley's largest uh, VCs. Uh, but from but from my point of view, um, you know, this orchestration um, of, of financing strategy, I think, is a, is a real missing gap um, that entrepreneurship courses generally don't address. Uh, and, and policy work to think around, um, you know, some of the skills that are required and that, to actually embed that that into uh, early stage startups would be um, highly valuable um, going forward. Thank you for that. And, and Rebecca. Oh, I'm going to have to go and look up what Sequoia is doing. That's that's really interesting to hear about. Um, for, for, for me, the, the thought that I'm going to go away and chew on is um, is the view of growth, actually. The, you know, the, 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 it feels to me like the fundamental, the sort of challenge here is that we, we've got a one dimensional view of growth and that's around financial growth and financial return. Um, and and, the, you know, the, um, and the, that that's quite restrictive. Um, and maybe there's, there's more room in between 
um, different models where you know, the public funding is, is measured in a, a different way and the, you know, the, the private financing sort of necessarily is totally focused on on financial returns, but maybe maybe that we're seeing an increasing move towards um, measuring different impact um, the, the areas. Um, but maybe there's there's a there's a room there's room in the middle where there's there's financial returns is balanced also with you know employment, uh, you, know, with, with, you know innovation output, you know lives saved by healthcare interventions. Goodness knows what we could do, but whether there's some some way to actually to make that more of a driver of the sector is the thought that I'm going to take away. No, that's great. Thank you very much. And I, I, I suppose just to throw one last thing in, really, I guess when we talk about innovation, defining what we mean. Um, often when we're talking about innovation, are we talking about innovation at the frontier? There is a huge debate coming out of the innovation strategy in the UK around innovation in terms of the adoption and diffusion agenda, which can fuel further frontier innovation. How do we build that capacity and that capability is something that is becoming increasingly important as well. So um, on that note, I, I'd very much like to thank our, our four speakers and contributors to the discussion. It's been uh, a really interesting discussion to be able to chair today. So thank you very much for that. And I hope those uh, that have dialed in and are listening to the recording have enjoyed it as well. So um, thank you very much for, for making it today. And I hope you can uh, make it to the next one in the series as well. So thank you all. Helen, yes, and uh, 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 thank you, Tim, uh, and thank you, fantastic panel, and thank you, everybody, for, for joining, and thank you to Orla and Isabel for facilitating all of this. But it's brilliant debates. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Okay.